I, Anthony Norman Albanese, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will well and truly serve the Commonwealth of Australia, her land and her people in the office of Prime Minister. It is done, Australia. We have a new Prime Minister after a marathon six-week campaign where it felt like not too much actually happened in that whole six weeks. In the last 72 hours, we've had an election. We've already had a swearing-in ceremony and Anthony Albanese is officially in the top job along with four of his new front bench, Penny Wong, Richard Miles, Katie Gallagher and Jim Chalmers. And Albo, he's already pledging to bring the parliament together. People do have conflict fatigue. I want to work with people and I do believe uh, that we can do politics better and I hope to do so. I mean, I do think that J. Laura and I have been uh, specific victims of the conflict fatigue that we have seen over the last six weeks and beyond. I'm Georgie Tunney. And I'm James Law. And this is Flash Drive. J. Law, we usually begin with a what a week, but let's change that. What a weekend for this very special edition of the podcast because we have a new PM. The election's been and gone. <laughs> yeah, crazy. And Saturday night was so fascinating to watch, um, you know, then the live coverage of everyone trying to make sense of what was a really, really unusual result in the way it played out across the nation. Um, we'll get into this, but, like, what was so fascinating is that you know, what was happening in Western Australia was not at all what was happening in Victoria, not at all what was happening in Queensland. So it was kind of all over the shop and just made it such a fascinating result. Well, that was the thing. I, I know that you, J-Law, were in the office making sure that Flash uh, was pumping out the latest and all the most up-to-date information. I was actually at a 30th when the count <laughs> began and I remember sitting down and I heard Anthony Green, ABC analyst, say that, you know, it's going to take a while before we could really make sense of anything. Uh, fast forward probably like 20 minutes and he declared that the coalition were defeated and I was like, what? Wait, hang on, hang on. What's going on? What's happening? We have to leave. Left the 30th, ran home, started watching <laughs> on platform what was going on because it was really remarkable. Were you thinking that we would see such a swing against the coalition and against the Liberal Party, really? No, and I, d I don't think anyone thought that the teal wave that happened would be quite as strong as it was in the end. Mm -hmm. So many people were thinking, oh, they might pick up a seat here, Goldstein, they might pick up a seat there. But so many of those blue ribbon have been in liberal hands for as long as, you know, federation have all been knocked over. And in the process, nearly all of the moderate wing of the liberal party is gone. It's so extraordinary that, that you know, and then now there's this new force in politics that it's hard to think about how that will be unwound in coming elections if this new suite of women perform. We talk about the new force in politics. At the time of this record, because 76 is the magic number, right? That's the number that everyone's chasing, the major parties are chasing so that they can form majority government. The Labor Party has about 72. The coalition is on 52 seats. There's about 15 seats, I think, as independents, which is huge. We're going to talk more about the independents. The Greens have three. There's still about 12 to 14 seats in doubt. Do you think that Labor can get a majority government? Will they? Yes, I do. And most of the experts seem to think they will get there. So it'll be the barest of majorities. But that doesn't really matter. A majority is a majority mm. and you've won and they won't actually probably need to rely on the support of the Greens or the Teal Independents in the lower house um, to get their legislation through. Different story in the Senate, but um, in terms of a, a workable government majority, they're off to the races. Even if they don't quite get there, it doesn't really matter. Um, the independents or enough of them have indicated to Anthony Albanese that they will um, not challenge the government's standing, so give it confidence and give it supply, which means they'll have the money 
to do the, what they want and also they have the confidence of the parliament, which means you're a legitimate government. So even if they're in minority, Albo's the guy. He's the PM. <laughs> He is the 31st Prime Minister of Australia. And flash drivers, I can basically hear you really just yelling at us right now. Who won in terms of J-Law and I in picking the Prime Minister race? Um, and J-Law, I have to hand it to you. Claps all round. Round of applause. It was James Law who predicted that Anthony Albanese was going to be the next Prime Minister. I got a little bit of cold feet towards the end after initially tipping that it was going to be a minority Labor government. I was like, oh, I just think that the coalition may hang on. God, was I wrong. <laughs> so, J-Law, how, how did Albo turn this around? And was it really a case of people voting for Albo or voting out Morrison? Yeah, well, I think it's really interesting when you dig into the results, what that tells you. And mm. I think that they definitely were voting against Scott Morrison. Yeah. I don't think that there was a huge amount of enthusiasm for a new Labor government, nor Anthony Albanese in particular. And the reason I say that is if you dig into the primary vote, that mm. is the number of Australians who wrote number one for Labor, it was about 32% at the mm -hmm. time that we're speaking, which is low. That's very low. And in fact, that means that, you know, only one in three Australians voted Labor as their primary vote. Um, so it's, it's an interesting state of affairs where a new government is swept to power where they have such a small primary vote. And how does that, how, when it comes to primary vote, J-Law, and how typically that has been a lot higher, what does this mean now, though, going forward? Do we need to start changing our mindset and changing our concept of the two major parties? Because if, you know, you can win government with only 32% of the primary vote, as you said, a third, surely that has a, that's a big warning sign for the Labor Party, the coalition, because the rise of the independents, the rise of the other smaller parties has really been on display coming out of the mm. pandemic. Well, I think we're already there. I think that yeah. this election was a wholesale rejection of those two brands, the coalition mm. and Labor, from the general public. You know, you talk about the conflict fatigue. People were just sick of them. And so they parked their votes elsewhere. And it just so happens if you kind of vote green that kind of trickles up to labor anyway um so it meant that there was enough to get them over the line into government but yeah i i think that people it, this may be the end of that real domination between those two parties and a lot of commentators are like it'd be chaos if we have too many more independents and a hung parliament would be the worst possible thing for australia but these things happen in other countries like Germany and, you know, in other parts of the world all the time where, you know, I think it happens in New Zealand quite common and commonly where these kind of rainbow coalitions uh, are, the, are the way that people get into government. And oftentimes, and, you know, that was true of the last hung parliament we had with Julia Gillard at the helm, there was no, that they were pu pushing through legislation all the time through negotiation, <laughs> yeah. which is like a crazy notion. Instead of just being like, no, you're not on our team, they had to get people on board and, you know, say what you will about that parliament, but it was very productive and mm -hmm. it got heaps and heaps of stuff through, much more than Scott Morrison ever did. So um, I don't buy that argument that it's all chaos. But, yeah, to go back to your original question, I think it was largely... Uh, just a rejection of Scott Morrison. Mm -hmm. I think that people were over him. They did not trust him. They did not like him. And mm -hmm. I think that's why we have Albo. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I think you are 100,000% on the money there. I think that people wanted a change. It had been nearly a decade of the coalition and I think that it was just time. There was an expiry date on it. You add in the last two years, which have felt like 200. And I think it was just time for something new, something different. And I do think that not only Scott Morrison's brand, but overall the coalition's brand 
really did fail to engage women. Mm -hmm. And that has been a huge, huge um, undersight for Scott Morrison, uh, the former PM, and his administration because, as we've seen with the teal steel, if we call it that, that there is such a market for the professional woman voter as having some sway and having some influence. So I think that Anthony Albanese just happened to be, you know, the person that is the benefit, the beneficiary yeah. of this state of political climate across the country at the moment. I want to get into Scott Morrison and the Liberal leadership and everything in a second, but what was the moment for you, Jayla? What moments really stood out for you on on Saturday night? I think one for me was when I saw Josh Frydenberg get up and again at the time of recording this podcast still technically hasn't conceded. Yeah, but he's gone. He's gone. He's, go- he's gone. <laughs> he's gone. He's gone. Like him stepping up and saying mathematically still have a chance but, you know, that but is going to be hard. Mm. I think that was the moment where I was like, wow, the Liberal Party has absolutely imploded here and I, I that was the part where I, I couldn't quite couldn't quite believe it because, you know, that's the treasurer and he couldn't even, he's out of parliament now. It's yep. brutal, brutal. So brutal. And you got to feel yeah. for him. Like he was a good parliamentarian. You like, you may not, you know, be on that side of politics or you may not mm-hmm. have agreed with the coalition on every matter, but he was a quality, really good politician mm-hmm. and he's gone. And probably yeah. not because of himself, more because of um, Scott Morrison again. He suffered mm-hmm in his seat because of Scott Morrison. Um, but the the night the, the moment of the night for me was a bit earlier when the first booths were reporting for Wentworth. Yes. And, you know, admittedly, I think the first booth was like Darlinghurst, which is much more of a kind of um, progressive part yeah. of that um, electorate. But mm-hmm. the amount of vote that Allegra Spender the independent was getting was off the charts and um you know and that kind of carried through the rest of the evening where um she was just way out in front and i knew that like a seat like goldstein in victoria was likely to go to the independent and it did zoe daniel but when you started to see oh wait they're getting they're looking good in wentworth they're looking good Mm -hmm. in kuyong they're looking good in north sydney and goldstein certainly it was just like across the board there was this just how successful that campaign was is remarkable Mm, mm. and I think that I'm not sure what it was J-Law but I mean we've talked about the rise of the teal independence and their potential influence for the best part of six weeks really everyone was talking about it but I'm not sure if it was like internalized misogyny or something within me I never truly believed that they were going to be elected and to actually unseat the incumbent, I don't think, until I saw those those, those Allegra Spender polling. Like I was like, oh, oh, okay, hang on, this is this is happening. Mm. You know, and I think that we were kind of conditioned through a lot of the campaign by vested interests to think that yes. they were illegitimate candidates. You know, mm-hmm. the, and I think the Liberal Party did a big mistake by trying to. Um, put these women down. You know, they use words, I call them groupies and things like that. And essentially, you know, the, the Liberal Party was like, how dare they? How dare mm. they waltz in here and take our seat? <laughs> and it's just like, <laughs> yeah. why can't they? Who says they can't? <laughs> Who says that they don't have to form a party? Who says yeah. that they, you know, that, why should they say who they're going to support in a hung parliament? There, mm-hmm. there isn't going to be a hung parliament. They are they are completely legitimate. Um, they stood on they stood on issues that their communities really care about that the Liberal Party has neglected for a long time. And to pick up what you were saying about the the women professional woman vote and the professional mm-hmm. woman candidate, the Liberal Party has been warned about this problem for the best part of a decade. Yeah. You know when Julie Bishop, you know left parliament she was very clear about this problem Mm -hmm. they struggle with quotas and not wanting to um you know give women any kind of leg up into the parliament that's just against their ideals but they just have this 
huge problem where there are not really any impressive women in no. the in the parliamentary federal liberal party mm-hmm. and there's <laughs> There's a lot of good women out there who could do a great job for that party, but they can't manage to get it right about how to pre-select them and get mm-hmm. them into the seats that they can win, and they paid for it big time yeah. this time around. And it, they, you go. No, you go. You go, Jayla. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. I was going to say. Yeah, they they certainly did, and I think that it's also interesting when you're talking about you know the professional woman vote and like having impressive uh, female parliamentarians. But by the same token, we also saw that the Labor Party's decision to parachute in Christina Keneally into the seat of Fowler really backfired, right? Mm-hmm. Because that electorate was like, uh, sorry, we don't know who you are. This is not a winnable seat, even though it is a safe seat, a safe Labor seat. We're going to go for the independent who has lived here and knows us. Yep. Yeah, and it, it was a shocker. And, like, the Labor Party had a good local candidate who I think may have won that seat if they had have run mm-hmm. with her instead of parachuting in Keneally. And, man, is her brand damaged because you know yeah she ran for Benelong and lost um and she she you know stepped out of the senate to take on this seat that should never have been in doubt yep. and the people the people had their say I, I i've often thought that the labor party overestimates her value to mm-hmm. the as an asset to them politically mm-hmm. you know they they often use her as the as the smart ass attack dog. That's the way they'd kind of use her in campaigns. And yeah. I'm not sure she's that big an asset. I don't know that people warm to her or um, want to hear from her as much as they might think. I think that's the key. She has this um, perception anyway of people not really being able to warm to her, able to see her as personable and someone who is like them. I don't think that she's relatable. So I'm with you, Jay Laura. And every time that I've had got to interview Christina Keneally, you know, she's been very polished, she's been very professional, but she doesn't really speak from the heart, I have to say. And I think that that is has been her downfall again. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I had to think this morning when Albo and his crew were getting sworn in, I was like, I wonder what she's thinking. Because, you know, faction wise, she would have been, you'd have to think if she had been elected and successful, she would have been somewhere high up in, in this cabinet. So yeah, I, I was, I was, I was wondering how all those little power plays behind the scenes ago <laughs> were yeah. going when it was all, when it was all happening. But um, if we put pause on, the Labor Party and our new Prime Minister for a second because I do want to get into Anthony Albanese's potential legacy. But before we get to that, let's talk about the outgoing PM in Scott Morrison. Uh, He will no longer be the Prime Minister of the country. He will also no longer be the Liberal leader. And this is what he said after stepping down in his concession speech. I, as leader, take responsibility for the wins and the losses. That is the burden and that is the responsibility of leadership. And as a result, I will be handing over the leadership at the next party room meeting to ensure that the party can be taken forward under new leadership, which is the appropriate thing to do. Full responsibility stands with the leader, apparently, j So that is Scott Morrison. I actually thought that his concession speech was very gracious. It was. Um, I thought that he said all the things that he, he needed to, and I don't think that he could have continued on. The issue here for the Liberal Party, though, is that someone who would be readily made to step in, Josh Frydenberg, no longer an option. Mm. So now we go into conservative versus moderate. Which way does the new Liberal Party, after they do some soul searching, where do you see them falling, J-Law? Well, it's really interesting. You know, so the the front runner to be the next Liberal leader is Peter Dutton, who's Mm -hmm. a conservative, right? A lot of the Mm. moderate members are gone. So um, there's that to consider about whether the conservative wing will have more power now. Mm. Um, And a lot of like conservative commentators are arguing right now that uh, the reason that they didn't get a good enough vote is because they abandoned a lot of these conservative arguments and and points of difference with Labor, including Mm. climate. But 
I don't understand how you can come out of this election and think less climate action is what is needed to yeah. win an election yeah. Yeah. when that's the that's the reason they got smashed everywhere. Is, mm-hmm. I mean, more so than anything else was climate action. That's the reason they lost all those blue ribbon teal seats. So I think that they may lurch to the right, but I don't understand how that would make any sense given what Mm. the result tells us about where the electorate is, you know, where the, where the people are. I think the people have moved well past the coalition on climate change and those issues. They've been dragged kicking and screaming to the mainstream, you know, that this is the mainstream issue now that Australia needs to do more. So I think if they turn their back on that and try to be like, you know, yay coal and um drop net zero i think that would be madness Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i have to agree and it seems that people within the coalition and within the liberal party are with you jay law this was simon birmingham the outgoing finance minister shadow finance minister what's the technical term now is he now the shadow (laughs) how does this work yeah (laughs) shag on a rock simon birmingham (laughs) speaking after the election just about that but who, what the leader will need to do, whoever that may be. I will be looking to make sure that whomever takes on that role understands the task ahead uh, and hopefully has uh, a clear enough picture of how to go about that task and particularly how to ensure that, uh, that we bring into the Liberal fold uh, more Australian women uh, and ensure they are pre-selected in far greater numbers uh, so that we can ensure our party better reflects the reality of modern Australia within our ranks. Okay, so Bermo there, Jay Laws, seems to be suggesting what you are in that maybe Peter Dutton is not the way to go. But if it's not Peter Dutton, who on earth is it? Because I can't see another option really. I've heard Dan Tien's name getting thrown around. I've heard plenty of women's names getting th- thrown around when it comes to the deputy leader, be it Anne Rustin, uh, Karen Andrews, Susan Lee. But, I mean, uh, outside Dutton, I don't know if there's a candidate that you just go, yep, them, mm. they're the ones. Well, the only other person that I've heard mentioned is Angus Taylor, but oh, I don't know. Like none of it's <laughs> none of them seem super impressive uh and well, especially so, if they want to if they want to be serious about climate right well, exactly. angus taylor doesn't seem the way to go no yeah. so i think it'll be dutton um mm-hmm. but uh, you know i think peter dutton might surprise people so he's been in these kind of hard head roles defense minister the macho roles but <laughs> he, i think that australians will see a different side of him if he becomes mm. liberal leader he's very well liked within his party more so yes. than scomo like ScoMo was not very well liked in his party, which is not unusual. Malcolm Turnbull was not very well liked in his party. His party likes Dutton and they think he's a decent guy and and a good leader. So um, I think Australians might be surprised about him and that he might um, get a bit of cut through. So, Mm. but in terms of how he brings the broad church back together, that's a task. And they're so far behind. They lost so, so, so many seats. There's an existential crisis going on Mm -hmm. in the Liberal Party is if we no longer stand for well-off inner city professional people, then who do we represent? Um, Mm -hmm. Because they didn't do that well in seats that they thought they might be able to pick up because no. they knew they were going to lose teal seats. So they thought, oh, well, maybe we'll be able to pick some more in the suburbs and regions and stuff. It wasn't very successful. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, certainly the, the whole Catherine Deves thing was a debacle. Like she she did awfully. <laughs> yeah, she did so terribly. And, I, and you're right, J-Law, because I think I read somewhere this morning that it's possibly the first time I think that the coalition or the Liberal Party will not have any seats over the harbour, like over Sydney Harbour, being like Wentworth, Warringah, like they've lost all those now. They've been unseated. Mm -hmm. And you talk about, you know, the last election, Queensland really came through for them to deliver ScoMo that miracle win. But now Queensland's been renamed as Greensland, given, you know, the amount of climate destruction that we've seen over the last few years, I'd have to assume, in Mm. the terms of some of those swings there. And then WA, after the 
you know, controversial, but, you know, very strong performance of Mark McGowan during the pandemic, a Labor leader. Uh, they've really followed what's happening at a state level and carried that through to a federal level, which I know that in particular when we were talking about the South Australian election and we saw that swing go to Malinowskis and everyone was like, oh, yes, the federal, you know, Scoma was like, you can't take this, federal politics is totally different to state politics. However, Western Australia seems to not agree with that. Mm. I wonder whether some of the the language that that came out when WA locked itself up against the rest of the country, and there was a lot Mm. of Liberals um, saying that that was terrible and obviously very popular in Western Australia, that that move, whether that's the thing that killed them off there and, like, there was a big swing towards Labor in WA particularly. Um, Mm. So... Yeah, it's an interesting state of affairs, isn't it? Especially what you were talking about, about how different, you know, Brisbane was to what happened in Perth. Yeah. Like, remarkable that two Liberal seats are turning green. Like, that's mm-hmm. crazy, craziness. And in Queensland. It's insane. Yeah. Insane. And I'm a Queenslander. And I'm just like, what? I was watching those results being like, oh, my goodness, for real? And I think there's a one that one of the seats is still in doubt that could go red, so it could go Labor in Queensland too, and it's just uh, I I couldn't quite make sense. I was sitting there on Saturday night once I eventually, you know, escaped the 30th and got to watch it, and I was like, I just, interesting. I, I found it so, so interesting. I was glued, glued to the coverage and the performance, it has to be said, during the victory speech of Anthony Albanese too. Let's begin into what we think of Dear Albo, uh, but just a reminder, everyone listening, flash drivers, I've named you this now. That's what you will now be referred to and known as from here on out. Um, if you're actually loving this podcast, do let us know. Jayla and I just, you know, we can talk forever, but it would be great to know that you are listening to us. So do let us know, subscribe, leave five-star reviews, get that there, five-star reviews, just those ones. Five-star the ones reviews. we want. Five-star reviews and tell your friends, um, you know, even tell your enemies, we're not picky. Everyone needs to be across the news of the week. So if you're loving Flash Drive, do let us know. j Albo's victory speech. What did you think of it? How did you see him? I remember all the cameras that were, like, looking at his front door, like, waiting for him to move, waiting for him to be like, yep, yep, I am now the Prime Minister. What do you think? My fellow Australians, it says a lot about our great country that is the son of a single mum who was a disability pensioner, who grew up in public housing down the road in Camperdown. <laughs> can stand before you tonight as Australia's Prime Minister. My mother dreamt of a better life for me, and I hope that my journey in life inspires Australians to reach for the stars. Well, I thought it was really nice to hear what he had to say about his story. And he said, I hope my story inspires the rest of Australians to reach for the stars. And the reason he was saying that is um, I think every Australian knows now that he grew up in council housing. He grew up not well off. Um, You know, he's a child of a single mum. And to go from that to the highest job in the land is a remarkable story. And no matter your politics, I think everyone can get behind that sentiment. Um, He also put the Uluru statement from the heart at the centre of what he had to say, which I I thought was very interesting that he would Mm. go out there that strongly in his victory speech. Um, For people who aren't aware, this is about giving constitutional recognition to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution it's the sort of thing that the coalition ties itself in knots over, but um, mm-hmm. Albo's going to make it a priority. Um, so really interesting, I thought. Uh, what, what did you make of what he had to say? I'm with you on this um, Uluru statement from the heart. I was not expecting him to come out and have that be his first line of his acceptance speech. So I think that that was laying the platform and a very important platform for his government and how he is choosing to proceed. It's something that he's always backed. Um, so I think that that was a strong move by him. Uh, his story is great. I actually think that even just the way that he was interacting with um, some of the, shall we say, vocal, enthusiastic 
Albo fans in the room when he was talking. He was like, keep it down, like, blah, 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 like a bit of fun police really. Mm. I didn't mind that though because he was like, I think it sent a message, regardless of how good it was, but it sent a message of I actually can't be like, bullied or pushed around or this. I thought it was probably the most prime ministerial that I had seen him, mm. and which, you know, it took him getting the to be prime minister for me to see that, but, yeah. Well, that's interesting you say that because I wanted to know what you thought. So we saw him over this six-week um, campaign. Mm. There were some rough moments. There were moments where he wasn't Very across rough. the detail, where he got a bit annoyed with the press pack, where mm-hmm. he... M- you could argue, ran away from some scrutiny. What do you think he's going to be like as a prime minister? You know, a campaign's very different to the job of being Mm -hmm. a prime minister. Mm -hmm. Given what you know of him, how do you think he's going to go? I think he will initially, Oh, maybe it'll be a constant thing. I think it might take him a fair few more press conferences to really have that, um, shall we say, bulldozer-type mentality stick in that, you know, I'll answer the question, but I'll answer it my way. I won't let you interrupt me. He had that again this morning in his first speech, his first media conference after being sworn in. Uh, He cut a journalist off and said, you know, we will not be cutting in. Let's get that straight off the bat. Uh, I will have to answer. I will ask a question. I will answer it. You won't be cutting in. I won't, like, acknowledge your question. So I think that that's something, though, that will still be a press conference by press conference just because we haven't seen him prove that I don't think that he's completely comfortable in that setting yet. I still always have like a, uh, uh, uh. so it'll be interesting to see how it goes with the world leaders because straight away, I mean, you know, he's on a plane right now on his way to Tokyo to have quad talks with the US, with India and Japan uh, with Penny Wong right now. So I also do think though that a big factor of his speech, and he said it again this morning, was about wanting to bring the parliament together and bring Australians together and not have this divide anymore. If he can do that and use his background as, you know, for negotiating, then that can only be a strength for him going forward. It's just that he needs to take that now some nuance in that area and put it on the big stage Mm. when he's addressing the nation and addressing the media in particular. Yeah, well, we'll know soon enough how he goes. Um, Mm. It's going to, we'll be watching. (laughs) So, yeah, we'll see how Albo does. But I was interested to get your thoughts before we go about the legacy that Scott Morrison will leave behind. Mm. What do you think? I think it is a problematic one for the coalition, but particularly for the Liberal Party, given the decimation that we've seen of them since, since Saturday in particular. I think that... He had the hardest job in the world in getting us through the pandemic. So I will give him credit for that and seeing the steering the country through. Um, But I think as well, he was kind of clipped a little bit in exactly what he could do as prime minister at a federal level when the states had so much control during the pandemic. So I think that a lot of people's anger towards him, especially in those early stages and, you know, people were scared and weren't sure what was happening, I think that was a bit misdirected because the things that they were complaining about were largely at a state level. So I have to give him props for that. I, by the same token, have to give him the opposite of props, um, which is how he handled the latter stages of the pandemic when it came, oh, and also probably year two when it came to vaccines. They did not come here quick enough. It was always a race. And for him to say that it wasn't, I don't think he ever believed that. I think that he was just trying to cover for the fact that him and his administration had somehow not been able to order enough vaccines. Um, Mm. The lack of rats towards the end of the year didn't take an Einstein to work out that we're probably going to be needing needing them. Uh, So there's those few things that I don't think I will look back on and reflect and think of him in glowing ways. Then, again, his treatment of women I mean I think that the I have to ask Jenny or I was asking Jenny you know what she thought and then I could empathize I think that's where he lost a lot of people and if I'm being Mm -hmm. honest he probably lost me there as well in that particular phrase never really won back voters I don't think well definitely not professional 
professional female voters anyway. Yep. So I think he leaves a problematic legacy in terms of there's some things that people will look back on and think, oh, yeah, the country, you know, it did survive economically. It did do well throughout one of the toughest times the world has ever seen. Um, but from a social level, I think it's going to be really hard for the Liberal Party to claw back from from here. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I think for me, he will always be remembered for winning the election that he did, the miracle election. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he'll always get credit in liberal ranks for that because nobody thought he could do it and he won. So mm -hmm. he'll always get a tick for that. Um, I think JobKeeper was mm -hmm. the right policy at the right time. Maybe there were some questions about it being a bit too generous here and there, mm -hmm. but that really did help cushion the blow of COVID hugely for many Australians. And I know a lot of Australians would be thankful for that money. Mm -hmm. But yes, in terms of the way he played politics, I think the problem for him is that he never, he, he didn't really have the values that you want in a politician in the sense that, um, like, what did ScoMo really stand for? What did he really mm. believe in his bones? People would often disagree with someone like John Howard, but they knew where he stood mm -hmm. and they knew what he believed in and he had the, an ability to, like, get the electorate to go along with things that maybe they didn't like on the face of it because he seemed to believe in it. Mm. And even someone like Tony Abbott was was a more of a conviction politician than ScoMo. So I think that his problem is like, what did he really believe in? Mm. And then that gave um, opportunities for him to be attacked. And whenever he tried to belatedly um, correct course when he stuffed up, I don't think anyone truly believed him, you know, that he really cared about women's safety or anything like that. I don't think people ever thought he really got it. He never truly seemed repentant for some of his stuff-ups with the bushfires. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was all about political expediency and getting through. And so I think that's the that's his was his fatal downfall. If we're going to going to rate him 1 to 5, where you at? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> 3. <laughs> A neutral three. A neutral, neutral three. three. You know what he did give us, though? He gave us one of the most iconic covers that you will ever hear. April Sun in Cuba. Take me to the April Sun in Cuba. Oh. Take me to the April Sun in Cuba. Off he goes into the sunset. <laughs> Bye, Scotty. Off he goes. Bye, Scotty. You know, we'll, be, we'll see you in Hawaii. There you go. See you there. <laughs> Brutal. If you enjoyed the news and this podcast and want to learn more about Flash, you can sign up at flashnews.com.au. Flash lets you stream more than 25 news channels in the one place. New customers get 14 days free. Start streaming your news today.